Welcome everyone to this uh, virtual science forum Long Range Colloquium. Uh, by now you probably know about us, but let me just repeat that we are open, open platform for organizing scientific meetings fully online. We have a number of different, different types of meetings that we organize. We encourage you to check us out at virtualscienceforum.org or in our YouTube channel and, uh, and join if you are interested or organize your own talk or a conference. Uh, tonight is another, is another installment in our Long Range Colloquium series. We have Monica Eidelsberger, who is a professor at LMU in Munich. She did her PhD in Munich, then her postdoc in France in Jean Dalibard group, and then she came back to Munich. She is known for her work on like interesting lattices with ultra cold, uh, with, uh, ultra -cold atoms, uh, especially some interesting geometries and topological things. And lately she's been working on some exciting stuff with out of equilibrium phenomena and this is something she's going to tell us tonight. So please, Monica, go ahead and welcome. We are very happy to have you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for all uh, who are joining today for this um, online colloquium. Um, as was mentioned in the introduction, I want to talk about um, experiments that we have did have done with ultracolatums and optical lattices out of equilibrium. And under this title, I'm actually summarizing like two distinct works where we have um, and on one hand studied cold atoms out of equilibrium and asked the question of how these isolated quantum systems actually do thermalize. And in the second part of my talk, I want to um, explain a little bit how we can actually use out of equilibrium techniques, periodic driving, in order to engineer interesting lattice models. And before I start, uh, just a very, very brief uh, two slide introduction about uh, cold atoms and optical lattices. So essentially what we are doing is we use laser cooling techniques in order to prepare degenerate quantum gases. So we cool um, bosons or fermions close to zero temperature. And then we use artificial crystals of light that we generate by interfering laser beams in order to trap the, those atoms into periodic potentials. And these, or the mechanism behind that is using the IC stark shift. So we create this optical dipole potentials, and then we can arrange the atoms in, in um, all sorts of different geometries. For instance, the simplest example would be such a square lattice uh, that is depicted on the lower right. And now one can show that actually atoms that move around in this periodic potential that is generated by these interfering laser beams, the dynamics is described by Hubbard models. So depending on the uh, species, it could be either bosonic or fermionic Hubbard model. But in essence, um, the two main parameters describing the dynamics in this model are a hopping matrix element J or tunnel coupling between two neighboring sites in this periodic potential and a Hubbard on-site interaction energy U uh, that the atoms have to pay when they meet on the same lattice site. So it's a contact uh, interaction potential. And so in, in a sense, um, we can use it in order to simulate interesting condensed matter problems where now the atoms play the role of the electrons in that potential and the interfering laser beams uh, play the role of the ion crystal. And for example, just to uh, give you one specific model Hamiltonian that we can access uh, using the system is the bose hubbard Hamiltonian, where here you see the hopping or kinetic energy term proportional to the hopping matrix element J and the Hubbard interaction energy term that is proportional to the on-site interaction U. And so that's our starting point. This is um, uh, the model system that we know how to probe and how to control very well in the lab. We generated these systems in a high or ultra high vacuum chamber. That is, it's very nicely isolated from the environment, which is essentially also the reason why it al allows us to study fundamental questions related to thermalization of isolated quantum systems. But on the other hand, we can also nicely control all of these parameters, uh, the tunnel coupling by changing the laser power um, of the laser beams that is generating the potential, or we can use FESHPA resonances, for instance, to tune this Hubbard interaction energy strength U. And so in these two um, parts of my talk that I would like to introduce to you today, in the first part, I, I wanna show 
how um, these isolated quantum systems can be used to prepare nice low entropy initial states and then study the thermalization. And in the second part, I would like to focus on how we can use this control in order to engineer interesting quantum systems. So let's start with the first part, uh, which is about thermalization of isolated quantum systems. Now you may um, ask uh, the question, like if you prepare such a many body system in a certain initial state, um, which is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, but nonetheless um, applying the Hamiltonian uh, on initiating dynamics is a unitary evolution. So you may ask what it actually means uh, for the system to thermalize. And it's believed that generic systems are thermalized according to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, which uh, describes it on, on, a, on the basis of, an, of eigenstates. So um, in, in essence, you're saying that if you prepare an initial state at a certain energy density, um, you know all um, the quantities after long evolution times, which are then only governed um, by a few concept quantities, um, including the energy density that you use to prepare your initial state. And if you pick now any other initial state at a similar energy density after long times, it will be described by the same few um, quantities. Now, there are other systems which actually defy this uh, thermalization hypothesis. They are integrable systems which are characterized by an extensive number of concept quantities. But more interestingly, if we apply disorder to the system, um, many body systems can also defy thermalization. And this is described by an emergent um, extensive number of concept quantities, which means that if now we prepare a certain initial state, for instance, a charge density wave, while um, the infinite temperature limit would tell you that uh, this charge density wave, this amplitude modulation will decay and reach um, a value close to zero in the long time limit, this can persist uh, for arbitrarily long times in many body localized systems because they do not thermalize. And there have been many experiments now with cold atoms that studied precisely this question. So on the left, you see a picture that I've taken from a paper from Emmanuel Bloch, um, where indeed many body localization was observed, um, not in a um, potential with additional disorder, but in a quasi periodic potential. And on the right, um, there's an example from uh, Markus Greiner's group in Harvard, where they looked at a very similar system. And now it has become even possible to look at the dynamics of individual atoms in the lattice and look at quantities such as um, entanglement entropy to, to characterize the thermalization dynamics of these systems. So these are somewhat the two extreme ends, like on the, on the one hand, systems that do thermalize, uh, according to the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. And on the other hand, many body systems that defy um, thermalization due to this extensive number of concept quantities. However, more recently, there has been a, a, a large range of models in between these two extreme limits, which um, what we call break the um, ergodicity in, in a weak sense. That means um, that now the, the structure of the Hilbert space is much more rich. That is, there can be atypical states that do not thermalize, or the Hilbert space can fracture into, into small disconnected subspaces. And one example that you see on the slide here is uh, taken from Misha Lukin's group, um, where they have seen um, a first example of that experimentally, which was not expected. So they have a system of interacting Rydberg atoms and they have prepared also a, a kind of charge density wave initial state. And they have seen that after turning on the dynamics, there has been very long lived oscillations between two states um, that either occupy the odd or even sides in this tweezer array. And there have been a series of theoretical paper now discussing this uh, phenomenon. And what has been found is that in this whole many body um, structure of the Hilbert space, there are a few isolated states, um, a small subset um, that does not follow uh, the uh, eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So depending on which initial state you prepare, these states are only connected to um, a very small subset of other states in the many body spectrum, which um, explains this long lived oscillations. And in an analogy to classical systems, this has been dubbed uh, many bodies quantum scars. Um, a second example, which I've already briefly touched upon, is Hilbert space fragmentation. And these, this is a class of systems where 
um, it has been found that uh, a small number of conservation laws, for example, um, dipole moment conservation, leads to an additional substructure in the symmetry sector. So if you now look at this uh, schematic that I show here on the left, if you um, imagine this is your symmetry sector that is labeled by the good quantum number according to your conservation laws, if you look at its structure, you see that it actually um, fractures into even smaller um, subsectors that are not connected to each other. So if you prepare now an initial state that is within the symmetry sector, labeled by the quantum number according to the dipole moment conservation, then um, there's still a non ergodicity that is highly initial state dependent because now thermalization has to be understood or defined with respect to one of these emergent substructures, which are also called Krylov subspaces. And uh, this is what is known as Hilbert space fragmentation. And it's very exciting because it's a completely new phenomenon, which is distinct from many body localization. So it does not show the characteristic properties as um, the scaling of the bipartite entanglement entropy, for example, which has this characteristic log T growth. And it shows this um, large or high initial state dependence that is even states that are at a similar energy density may show very distinct uh, thermalization properties. And um, interestingly, uh, all of these phenomena somehow come together in a model that we can easily realize with our cold atom systems. And this model is the tilted Fermi-Hubbard model. Uh, as I explained before, we have this kinetic energy term proportional to the tunnel coupling J and a Hubbard interaction energy term U. Now we work with spin up and spin down atoms. So we work with a fermionic species in two different internal states. And on top of that, we apply this linear potential energy difference between neighboring sites uh, characterized by the strength data. And it turns out that this very simple model actually um, has a lot of different parameter regimes where we can look at this distinct uh, thermalization properties. Now, the, the reason why people looked at this model in the first place was actually to look at uh, localization phenomena in a lattice model that is translational invariant. We know that many body localization occurs in the presence of disorder. However, uh, people have looked for a long time uh, to other models to see if this is an essential ingredient in order to see localization. And um, the reason why people looked at the, the linear uh, or the tilted uh, Fermi-Hubbard model is that we know that in the non-interacting limit, the system localizes. So in the non-interacting limit, the eigenstates are the so-called Vanier-Stark eigenstates. Here, um, the cat J states label Fox states in um, the real space basis. And the new, in the presence of the tilt, the new eigenstates of the system actually have a non-zero overlap on neighboring sites, which however falls off um, more rapidly as compared to an exponential. So these eigenstates are actually localized. And if we look at dynamics in the system, for instance, uh, starting from an initially localized particle on, on a certain site in the lattice, and we turn on the dynamics and the tilted potential, we see that uh, the wave packet or the particle undergoes Bloch oscillation. This, this you see in this uh, so-called breathing dynamics, if you want. So this red point is actually the initially localized wave packet. And then you see this nice um, uh, periodic dynamics, which is called Bloch oscillations. And then it returns to its um, original starting point after one Bloch oscillation period. And the amplitude of this oscillation um, determines the scale of the localization length, which is determined by the ratio, sorry, of the tunnel coupling versus um, the tilt energy between neighboring sites data. So the question is, if you uh, have the starting point that the non-interacting system is localized, you may ask what happens now if we include or turn on non-zero interaction, does this lead to thermalization in the system or does it th uh, survive? And this was the starting point where people actually looked at the tilted Fermi-Hubbard model. And so if we look at the range of parameters that we can access in our system, um, you end up with the following diagram. So on the left, so on the horizontal axis, you see the interaction energy U and on the vertical axis, we have the tilt energy delta. So in the non-interacting regime, uh, we have this one year stark localization. And then there are several resonances that can occur in the system once you include, include interactions. And this is easy to understand because in this tilted lattice model, now, if you have two neighboring particles, tunneling is detuned in energy by this uh, tilt energy data. 
But now if the Hubbard and interaction energy is exactly equal to the tilt energy, you can initiate tunneling processes again, just energetically because uh, it's resonant, the tunneling process for one particle tunneling on top of um, uh, the opposite spin particle. So you can imagine that actually this interaction processes um, may, may lead to thermalization because they can initiate dynamics again. And you can have these long range resonances, right? So that's just between nearest neighbors, but you could have them between distant neighbors as well in the lattice. So there are many, many resonances in the spectrum, which naively you would expect lead to, leads to thermalization in the system. And um, what people have uh, then started uh, looking at is actually to add like a, a tiny amount of disorder, a small harmonic confinement in order to uh, lift all these uh, degeneracies in the many body spectrum and look at the dynamics of this um, interacting tilted lattice system. In particular in regimes where actually the <clears throat> interaction energy is, is small compared to the other energy scales in the system or on the order of the hopping. And what they have found is actually that the characteristic properties look very similar to conventional MVL. And um, this in regimes where actually this tiny amount of disorder uh, seem to be um, very small as compared to conventional MVL. And there have been also a couple of experiments now looking into this regime in particular with superconducting qubits and ions. And um, in, in a similar spirit, there has been an experiment with coal atoms in 2D. So this is actually what I show with this out of plane um, axis, which is not really the, the regime that we have been interested in our experiments. We really wanted to look at the dynamics of the clean system where all of this disorder and harmonic confinement can be neglected. And as I mentioned, due to these many resonances, you would actually expect that the, the system thermalizes and there's no localization. However, there's this interesting regime where people have found that the system may still be non-ergodic. And this is in the regime where this tilt energy um, is taken to infinity, where it's the largest energy scale in the system. And you can uh, derive perturbative Hamiltonians in this limit, in this parameter, um, one over delta. And what people have been found is, uh, what people have found is that in this limit, this emergent Hamiltonian describing the dynamics is characterized by a dipole moment conservation. And it has been known from fractonic models that this leads to this fragmentation of the Hilbert space that I've mentioned before. So what one actually expects is that in, in this limit where the tilt energy is the largest energy scale in the system, there's an intermediate time scale where the relaxation properties of our system is um, described by this emergent Hilbert space. Uh, fragmentation phenomenon. That is, if we prepare different initial states, we should see a highly initial state dependent thermalization dynamics. Now, when we started out uh, to study the system experimentally, um, most of the things um, that have been discussed were in this limit of stark MBL models where we have a small disorder and, and um, a small or a small harmonic confinement. So we actually looked at a regime where the tilt energy is not very large. So in the regime where delta over j is on the order of three, which um, does not uh, qualify as a perturbation parameter where we can really describe the system with this effective um, fragmented Hamiltonian. So we didn't really know um, at this point how the system would behave because it's neither in these two regimes where um, we would expect stark MBL or where we would expect this phenomenon of Hilbert space fragmentation. So we started out um, uh, looking at the properties of this model and over a wide range of parameters, but at relatively moderate values of the tilt. So let me just very briefly uh, tell you what uh, species we are working with. So we are working with fermionic potassium atoms at a um, relatively low temperature of T over Tf, T Fermi, that is on the order of 0 0.15. And we generated tilt using a magnetic field gradient now, since the two spin states are generated using two different Zeeman states uh, with different MF quantum numbers, the tilt is also slightly different. So there is a difference on the order of 10%, which, um, however, um, as we compared with numerics, didn't matter in all of the experiments that we've studied uh, so far in the regime we have studied so far. And we can tune the interaction, the Hubbard interaction energy strength using a Feshbach resonance at uh, 202 Gauss. And the initial state that we are looking at is this charge density wave of period two. So we prepare localized fermions on even sites in our lattice. 
And there's on average uh, one particle on every other side with an equal spin mixture. So we have an equal number of spin up and spin down atoms, but we do not control the spin ordering. So we have uh, charge localized fermions, but the spin uh, is randomly distributed. And then we measure the amplitude of this charge density wave, um, which is governed or described by this um, imbalance observable, where we measure the relative fraction of atoms on even and odd sides. So this is our initial state, and then we monitor the, the time evolution. Now, um, if you look at short times, so up to about 10 tunneling times, or maybe 20, 30 tunneling times, you see there are coherent oscillations, and the imbalance oscillates between one, uh, which is our initial state, and ideally minus one, depending on, on the parameters that we choose, and zero would mean that the amplitude of the um, charge density wave is completely washed out and has decayed. <clears throat> so this initial coherent dynamics is actually what we have seen um, as Bloch oscillations. So you have seen that this initially localized particle undergoes this breathing motion. And now if you project it down to measuring the fraction on even and odd sides, this just shows up at this as this co coherent oscillation where the um, frequency is given by the Bloch oscillation period. But then if we wait long, um, the light blue line is actually the non-interacting uh, case. Then we see that a steady state value develops and the Bloch oscillations uh, deface. So we have the steady state value, which in the non-interacting case, we can actually calculate analytically and matches perfectly with what we would expect for our lattice parameters. The analytic value is actually shown as this dashed uh, black line here. But now the interesting question is what happens if we turn on interactions. And here we have um, chosen a value delta equal to 3j, roughly, non-interacting and um, comparing it to the interacting case where u is equal to 5j. So that's the dark blue points. And there are two things that you see. So first of all, um, the coherent short time dynamics um, are more strongly damped due to the presence of interactions. And we have studied this regime carefully also to benchmark um, the interactions in our system to calibrate the interactions in our system. And then you see that there's also on intermediate timescales, there's a small offset that develops compared to the non-interacting case, but then it seems to stabilize um, and remain at a constant value even up to a thousand tunneling times. And this was very surprising for us to see because um, it's um, actually the, the residual harmonic confinement that we have in our experiment uh, does not play a role on these on these time scales. And we are in a regime where all of these energy scales are on a similar order of magnitude. So they are all competing with each other. It's not that one of these energy scales would be dominating. So it's not in one of these perturbative regimes where we actually know that non-negodicity non can uh, arise due to the phenomenon with Hilbert space fragmentation. And so we have actually scanned a whole range of different parameters, the tilt value, but also the Hubbard interaction energy. And there's only a small dependence on all of these parameters. So we find that the dynamics are stable uh, for long times. And the only dependence that we have seen in experiments is that there's some uh, dip as a function of the interaction energy used. So here you see the steady state value plateau as a function of the interaction energy. So and we, this, uh, yeah. sorry to interrupt. we have a question from Babak, please go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So in the previous slide, you had the um, the solid lines. Or is that a calculation or? Oh yeah. Sorry. You mean the the solid light blue and the solid dark blue? Yes. Line. Yeah. So that is calculated with ED. Sorry. That is calculated okay. with ED um, with a system of sixteen uh, lattice sites. Okay. Thanks. Right. And also, actually, so this well, you don't really see it behind the data. There's non-interacting data. There is a solid line, a light blue line. Uh, that's just from analytics um, that, okay. that we have calculated. Thank you. Um, yeah, so all of this actually, um, so we were very surprised to see that, but it also matches very nicely with our numerical um, analysis of the system. And uh, the same is true actually for the interacting case. Now it was a little bit more complicated to, to compute all this data also because we don't have an, a spin ordering in the initial state. So we have to, average over many different spin uh, realizations. So we model it as an incoherent uh, mixture of different spin configurations. And so you see here the dips, uh, which, is, which seem to us the only interesting point in the diagram where something interesting happens. So we looked at this a bit more closely 
and you can um, easily convince yourself that add is actually the resonant process where the Hubbard interaction energy matches two times the tilt energy. So this is where new tunneling processes are energetically resonant, which explains the dip intuitively because you have more processes that can lead to a relaxation of the density wave, but it does not really explain why it remains at a stable plateau. So we see that initially there's more dynamics, but then the steady state value is, is, is lower, but it's still a steady state value. So we have actually uh, measured this for a couple of different um, uh, parameters to see that this is indeed uh, this double tilt resonance, is the, uh, re resonance that we see in the experiment. And then we have tried actually for um, uh, quite a lot of time, which I, I will not show because there is a lot of numerical um, calculations that we have done to understand why the steady state value is so robust. And in particular for this resonant regime, the double tilt resonance, as we call it, we have uh, found, or uh, Pablo, our theory colleague, has uh, performed analytic calculations where he has derived another perturbative uh, Hamiltonian in the limit, we would now take the tilt energy to infinity and found that there's another fragmented Hamiltonian that exists in this regime. So even for all of these resonances that can occur in the many body spectrum as a function of the tilt energy, there seem to be different uh, fragmented Hamiltonians that explain the non-ergodicity at least in the large tilt limit. And then we, we set out to understand um, actually why on our timescales and for our parameters, it is also stable in our regime. And it seems that due to the um, energy differences that you have to pay in order to have these tunneling processes enabling dynamics in the system. So for instance, in, in what we call the dipole conserving regime, the microscopic process that initiates dynamics would be from our charge density wave having two fermions um, hop together onto the central side. But this costs an Hubbard interaction energy U. So all of these, there, there are many different energy penalties for this microscopic processes that constrain the dynamics in this model. And they uh, seem to, at least numerically, we were able to show that seem to be so um, dominant and significantly slowing down the dynamics that in our regime, even away from this large tilt limit, the steady state value survives um, up to many tunneling times. Like in our ED simulations, we didn't manage to see any decay of the imbalance at a tilt value of, of 3J. So there seem to be uh, remnants of this phenomenon of Hilbert space fragmentation that uh, seem to also explain the robustness in our parameter regime. But now what we are looking at um, at the moment is actually to move closer to the Hilbert space fragmentation regime. So we make the tilt energy larger and actually directly look at this initial state dependence. So we prepare um, different initial charge density waves by scanning the Dublin fraction to see that they have um, distinct thermalization behavior, which is explained um, by this uh, fragmentation into this disconnected subsectors in the symmetry sector. So this is um, uh, what we are currently working on and, and finishing writing up in, in a draft. So, right, so that's actually the first big block of my talk. So maybe if there are more, more questions about it, it makes sense to have a, a short discussion. Do we have anything? Uh, Onur, I think is raising hand, hand in real time. Go ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, thank you for your talk. Like I, I do li uh, like it. it's very really well prepared. Uh, I'm uh, my background is in quantum optics. Like I'm uh, recently started with the uh, condensator and like ultra cold atom physics. So I have some um, questions about some practicalities. So like sure. uh, in the uh, initial models, like you were showing, like uh, you had this um, interaction parameter J, for example, and like the other uh, optical lattice parameters. So like, I was wondering like, like how much uh, control do you possess over them? Like, for example, like uh, are they supposed to be like a dynamical time dependent term you control through like um, time dependent dependent pulses? Like let's say you are trying to transfer some uh, population. Do you do something like stimulated rapid, uh, sorry, Ra Raman? A, a diabetic passage or is it like something um like a dc term like is it like a constant uh yeah. that you can just tune yeah so that's a very good question and also connects very nicely to the second part of my talk so in all the experiments that i've mentioned right now it's a dc term so it's just a static potential that we keep on at all times 
And um, typically our dynamics happens on a time scale of milliseconds. It's relatively slow. And we can tune this um, tunneling energy J over a wide range. So we can basically go all the way from switching it off completely um, for the lifetime of our, our system to having dynamics on the order of, of, of a kilohertz. And this we do by tuning the intensity of the laser beam. So just by changing the power of the beams that we use to generate the potential. But of course, since we um, control the tunnel coupling J using the laser beams, we can also dynamically change it. So we can modulate it in time or um, in, in the previous experiments, maybe that's something interesting to add. It's not uh, static um, during the whole course of the experiment. The lattice will be deep for initial state preparation, for example, where we prepare a product state of uh, localized fermions. But then in order to study the dynamics and see the relaxation, we would then quench it suddenly or project the system onto a new Hamiltonian where the tunnel coupling is much larger. And this we do by suddenly changing the laser beam power from a high value to a, to a, a much lower value in order to let the atoms tunnel. But then, um, for instance, for detection, we would uh, change it again in order to freeze all the, the charge dynamics or the density distribution. And um, there we, we quench it again, we project it to a Hamiltonian where the tunnel coupling is negligible. Uh, this was really clear. Thank you, actually. Uh, the second half of my question uh, exactly relates to your answer. So uh, you said like for the initial state preparation too, like you had some, uh, you, you have some uh, level of control too, like you said, like you prepare like product states. So I was wondering like if you can just uh, prepare, let's say uh, for a given side, let's say like a superposition states or something like that. Right, so that's also um, why there I, I could talk uh, uh, for a very long time, I think, and, uh, to, to uh, discuss the different ways of preparing initial states. But for this um, particular example that I mentioned, this charge density wave period two, um, there we actually use uh, what we call a bichromatic super lattice potential. So we overlap two standing waves, which have a periodicity ratio that is exactly equal to two. And we can tune uh, the relative phase and relative depths of these um, two potentials independently, which means we can generate a 1D lattice which has a, a double wave structure. So now uh, the unit cell consists of two sides and you can manipulate the energy difference within one unit cell. So now you can imagine if you start with a um, lattice that has initially a larger period um, increased by two and you prepare one uh, fermion per site, you can use the second lattice and uh, shift the energy such uh, that when you have both lattices on, only every other side will be populated. And then you can remove the other lattice again, which leads to this initial uh, charge density wave of period two. Now, having said that, there are actually also sorts of, uh, all sorts of other initial states that you could prepare. For instance, if you have uh, this unit cell, which is a symmetric double well, you could also imagine preparing a coherent superposition between these two sides, for example, in initial state and having it only localized within each double wave. Or you can think about playing with the internal state and preparing like a coherent superposition between up and down, for example. Now this, depending on what you want to study, it may be a little bit more challenging in terms of coherence time, but for sure all the charge degrees of freedom, they are usually, the coherence time is long compared to the, to the dynamics that we are interested in. Does that affect your uh, thermalization that you are uh, making? Uh, right. So, so far, we actually have only looked at the period two charge density wave that I've mentioned. Um, for the coherent superposition in a double well, I would need to think um, what observable we would measure exactly. Um, that's, that's maybe the most interesting question. Now, if you extend it to uh, quantum gas microscopes where you can actually manipulate each uh, individual atom in, in the lattice, you could for sure um, prepare initial states where you have a larger um, period of the charge density wave, for example. And this should lead to different relaxation dynamics when we are in the regime of the Hilbert space fragmentation um, that occurs at large tailed energies. Yeah, so that would be definitely something interesting to look at. Also, uh, something that I forgot to mention, uh, recently there has been also a new theoretical study where they have found these many-body scars, these long-lived oscillations between different states, 
also in this tilted uh, Fermi Hubbard model. So it's actually a very nice um, platform in a sense that it allows you to look at the connection between all these different uh, thermalization phenomena um, in one and the same model. This was really clear. Okay, thank you. Then we have a next question from Stephen. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. So a couple of questions. The uh, spin excess quantity, which was the difference between the spin up and spin down, I didn't detect it, but have you explored the dependence on your observations on varying that control parameter? So we have started uh, looking into that. Mm. Um, in, in 1D, uh, so maybe just to, to explain or for everybody else and if I got the, the question correctly. So, so far the data that I've shown is for equal mixture of spin up and spin yeah, down. Yeah. And typical case, our, yeah. yeah, typically our magnetization is conserved. So the Hamiltonian will not uh, change the, magnetis the total yeah. magnetization. Mm -hmm. But um, it's of course interesting to ask what happens if you prepare a spin imbalanced system. So if you decrease the fraction of spin down particles, for example. Mm -hmm. And what initially we were trying to look at is, we know that a spin polarized sample is just when you start localized because it's effectively non-interacting. Mm -hmm. And what we were trying to see is if by adding a small fraction of impurities that are spin up, which would be interacting with spin down, for example, if they would be somehow able to delocalize the system, there have been some numerical studies suggesting that there's a regime where this may be possible because we have different tilts for the two mm -hmm. uh, spin up and spin down with the magnetic field gradient. Um, it's not very conclusive yet, I have to say. So we haven't seen a so, strong signature. Yeah, yeah, the reason for asking it is I've worked on classical spin systems with ordering dynamics where I've studied the, the role of varying such a conserved quantity. So that's that's why I was interested. The second okay. thing is there was a, just a, it's an observation. You don't have to make any serious remark on it just now. But there's a slight asymmetry, a broken symmetry between the spin up and spin down uh, potential difference. So although you've got a critical state of fifty fifty, it's still not completely symmetric. So right, it's actually true. That's something I didn't mention. It's a it's um, a valid point. So indeed. If you look at um, this regime that we are interested in right now, where we are mm -hmm. trying to, to see the Hilbert space fragmentation, it only survives if uh, it's completely symmetric um, between spin up and spin down. So what we have done in order to see this physics now is actually to, mm -hmm. to couple them. We have switched on an additional RF coupling between an, uh, spin up and spin down states in order to remove the spin dependency on the, on the tilt energy. So we can use this technique to make it completely symmetric and only then you actually do see the Hilbert space fragmentation phenomenon in the, in, in the experiment. Okay, thank you. Super, I don't see any more questions. Last chance, looks like no. So I think we can go back to the talk. Okay, um, so let me start with the, the second big topic I may not no, let's see, I may not make it all the way through, but um, so the idea was to precisely talk about how we can now use this control that we have over our quantum many body system in order to engineer new interesting phases of matter. And our big motivation for that was to study and simulate topological phases of matter that have been discovered in condensed matter. And originally the mo motivation for us was that Okay, we know that our Fermi Hubbard model or Bose Hubbard model, we can do very nice simulations. Um, this we know now since, since many years. But in order to study topological phases of matter, we need new ingredients. We need something in order to make the model more interesting. And um, I've here put just a small selection of materials of phases that have been studied, like integer fractional quantum Hall insulators, topological insulators in two and three dimensions, or why semi metals. You know, there are, there are plenty of uh, other examples out there. Um, but what I want to keep, uh, what I want you to keep in mind is actually integer quantum Hall systems, which is the easiest way to, to explain how the techniques um, have been developed in the lab in order to study uh, 2D topological systems with ultra cold atoms in, in square lattice and um, also more recently in, in hexagonal and honeycomb lattices. So um, this slide you have seen, I'm sure in, in one form or the other, 
I just want to highlight a, a few things that may be interesting to keep in mind in order to, to understand how we characterize certain Floquet topological phases in, in the lab. Um, so in order to visualize um, for non-interacting two-dimensional systems, how the topological properties uh, come about, often this, uh, this picture of geometric objects is used. So you know that we can classify geometric objects by looking at the number of holes in the surface. And um, this genus of the object is actually connected to the local curvature uh, by Gauss-Bonnet theorem. So what I want to highlight here is actually that we have um, this local curvature omega, which when integrating it over the closed manifold of um, the, the surface of the object, gives us an integer topological invariant, which globally characterizes the topological system and allows us to classify it. So this is this number nu. So what I want you to keep in mind is this connection between like a local curvature that we can integrate over a closed manifold, which allows us to assign an integer topological number to the system that allows us then to classify it. And similarly, we can do that for periodic systems um, where now we define this local curvature, the barrier curvature in quasi-momentum space. And if we integrate it, over the full manifold, which in this case will be the Brewing zone, we get the churn number, which allows us to classify this uh, specific energy band of our electronic system. So this uh, index mu here indicates uh, the different bands that we have in a periodic system. And what happens at a topological phase transition is that these churn numbers can change via gap closing points in the spectrum. So this is this a uh, violent operation uh, that is often uh, cited or um, used to illustrate uh, the different topological classes of geometric objects. For instance, if now you would um, want to um, change the sphere such that it's in the same class as the donut, you would need to punch a hole through the sphere, which is a quite violent operation. And now in our um, condensed matter systems, we can think about it as gap closing points in the spectrum, which can change the churn number. And actually these uh, gap closing points themselves, can, the geometric properties of these gap closing points can be characterized. And this is what we have been doing in our experiments in order to characterize in more detail these topological phase, transition um, topological phase transitions that can take us from one topological regime into another when varying uh, certain parameters of our model Hamiltonian. And in order to um, introduce the technique that we use in, uh, in some cases to engineer topological systems uh, with cold atoms, I would like to keep you in mind or remind you about the integer quantum Hall system. And um, what you see here on the right is a schematic diagram of um, the transverse Hall resistance in a quantum Hall bar, so two-dimensional electron gas as a function of the applied magnetic flux. And you know classically that there's a linear dependence between the Hall resistance and the applied magnetic field, which is uh, penetrating the Hall bar uh, perpendicular. But if you cool the system to very low temperatures and very strong magnetic fields, what has been found is that there are these plateaus appearing, which is known as the integer quantum Hall effect. And why these are so interesting is because they are very robust, they're independent of the details of the uh, sample that has been used in order to measure this. And it has been connected precisely to the topological properties of the energy bands that are occupied with electrons. So in, in a nutshell, uh, the value of these plateaus is determined by the integers that characterize the topology of the individual energy bands that are occupied by electrons. And if uh, several bands are occupied, we just sum up all of them. And now you all know that actually this is not the only explanation why these spike topological um, invariants characterizing the different energy bands, but we can also look at what happens at the edges. So this is very characteristic for quantum Hall systems. They're insul insulating in the bulk, but they are current carrying um, edge modes in between uh, two distinct topological phases or in between a quantum Hall insulator and vacuum. And indeed, there's a correspondence between these two. So the bike uh, topological properties that I've introduced, the churn numbers, and the number of edge modes um, that uh, contribute in, in a quantum Hall insulator. And there's a unique um, correspondence. So if we know all the churn numbers of the bands that are occupied with electrons, we also know how many edge modes exist 
at the edge of the sample. So this is known as spike edge correspondence. You can either use one or the other to describe the properties of the system. And what we have uh, done with coletons, as I will show, is actually measure um, bulk uh, geometric or topological properties. Now, how can we actually make our system more interesting and make it topological? And there it's also interesting to keep um, this model of a whole bar in mind, where we see that interesting properties arise when we place a two-dimensional electron gas in a large external magnetic field. So one way to make uh, the block bands topological is to break time reversal symmetry, or in other words, apply a magnetic field to our system. Now there we run into problems because our atoms are charge neutral. So applying a magnetic field will introduce some Zeeman shifts or magnetic linear, uh, magnetic gradient, a linear potential, as I mentioned in the previous part of my talk, but it will not lead to any Lorentz force. Uh, so, so we have to find another uh, technique in order to do that. And I, I will stop uh, for a second in order to take the question. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. Just to clarify, so uh, you've described this uh, topological notion in two dimensions. Uh, so that's in some sense a continuous universe, but now you're looking at a lattice. So a lattice in some sense, of course, you've drawn it in the plane, but your Hamiltonian is just on a graph. So how does that know that it's two dimensional? So um, I'm not sure I understand the question fully. So initially, I thought you were going to ask about the effect of the lattice potential itself, which introduces... No, 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 it's just, 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 just purely yeah, just, just a but, mathematical question. So the, the, the topological classification, you had Gauss curvature for the manifolds, and the integral of the Gauss curvature gives is really to the genus. Then you made the analog of integrating the Berry curvature. Right. But this is integrating over Brion zones. So, to, I mean, these are over sets in space with dimension. But now you're looking at a lattice, and I don't see Brion zones, and I don't see, you know, extensive spaces with dimension. So, could you help me that link for me? Yes, yes, sure. So, I mean, we are working in a in a two-dimensional lattice as drawn schematically here, and we restrict the motion of the atoms such they can only move in this horizontal plane but there's no motion out of plane. So it's really um, a two-dimensional system. And now if you um, look but, at this- but again, but again, Just to make my point, my point is if you look at a Hamiltonian, right. the Hamiltonian doesn't carry any dimensional structure. It's just a graph with neighbor relations. It doesn't actually hold that information of I'm embedded in two dimensions. Right. So this Hamiltonian that I'm writing here was the JIJ, the hopping term between neighboring yeah. sides. This sum runs over the nearest neighbors in this two-dimensional graph. I see, it's fine. We, 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 I, I can come at the end of the talk. <laughs> Just okay. I want to hold you up. Thank you. Okay, fine. So if we, um, well, if we now believe we are in two dimension, this periodic lattice, um, which we know we can diagonalize using block theorem, and then we have our uh, quasi-momenta in the green zone. Um, we can ask what happens if we apply a magnetic field, which is what we want to uh, simulate with our ultra cold atoms. And for that, uh, we look at the system that, or the Hamiltonian that we would get if we were to deal with electrons in the presence of an external magnetic field. And how the dynamics is described is with complex hopping matrix elements. So you will see that in the presence of the external magnetic field, if you describe, or if you write down this lattice Hamiltonian, these hopping matrix elements are no longer real, but complex. And these phases are the Aharonov Bohm phases discretized on the lattice between neighboring sites. So these phases are related to the vector potential that generates the magnetic field. That is, if we now were to integrate this around a closed loop, which on the lattice in this discretized version is just the sum of all of these phases to compute the corresponding Aharonov Bohm phase then the sum of all of these phases can be interpreted as a ma magnetic flux piercing the unit cell of the lattice. Now for electrons moving around in this potential in the presence of an external field, this would be indeed the magnetic flux piercing the unit cell. But now what we can do in our artificial quantum systems is generate these phases by any other means using additional laser beams or laser assisted tunneling techniques. And now if we manage to make these homepage matrix elements complex, 
then we can uh, reinterpret this as an artificial magnetic flux piercing our lattice system. And um, as you can see here, the phase um, that the particle picks up around the closed loop is expressed um, in terms of the magnetic flux in units of the magnetic flux quantum. And since we are engineering these phases by hand, they are naturally on the order of pi or two pi, which means if we translate this back into real magnetic fields for um, an, a normal condensed matter system solid state material with a lattice constant between neighboring sides is on the order of angstrom, then this would be, correspond to very large magnetic fields on the order of a thousand Tesla or actually even more than that. So there we are actually in a regime of very large uh, magnetic fields where the dispersion um, of the lattice does uh, start to matter and we are very far away from the continuum limit. Now, um, let me speed up a little bit in order to not take too much time. Um, the, the way we do this is actually by periodic driving. So we take one some of our system's parameters and vary them periodically in time. And this allows us to describe the dynamics of our system stroboscopically, meaning after integer, integer multiples of the driving period. So we can write down a time evolution operator for one period of the drive that we can always express in this form where now this new Hamiltonian HF appears, the Floquet Hamiltonian, which is time independent. And now um, after integer multiples of the drive, we just keep applying this time evolution operator. So effectively, if we measure the system stroboscopically, it looks as if the system would evolve according to this uh, Floquet Hamiltonian. And the properties of this Floquet Hamiltonian can be um, engineered by choosing the parameters of the drive. And I wanted to, to keep this uh, or show you this, but it actually doesn't matter in, in the interest of time. The only uh, message I wanna give you is that by choosing the parameters of the drive, we can engineer new model Hamiltonians that then show this distinct topological properties. Um, and in particular, uh, this technique has been used uh, to implement two famous topological lattice model, models, that is the Hofstadter model and the Haldane model, which host um, interesting topological phases. Now, let me jump a little bit, maybe. So keep in mind that the Floquet engineering technique was originally introduced to emulate model Hamiltonians that otherwise we would not be able to access in our system. But now uh, we have been asking the question how um, we can use these techniques and maybe engineer systems that go beyond what we already know from condensed matter. Okay, so the question is now with this control technique, can we realize topological phases that we can otherwise not access? And um, the idea is now as follows. So in this periodically driven system, energy is not conserved or only up to integer multiples of this driving energy quantum H bar omega, where omega is the frequency of the drive. So we now have this periodic quasi energy spectrum where we can define new uh, Brewing zones, so called Floquet Brewing zones, in the quasi energy space. So now one Floquet zone actually goes from minus h for omega half to plus h for omega half. And this point down here is equivalent to the one up here. So now we can have a very interesting situation, a situation that is an, an edge mode in the system can wind across the energy spectrum. So typically the connection between the number of edge modes in the system and the churn number of a particular band is as follows. The number of edge modes leaving the energy band from the top and entering from below. So the difference between these two edge modes is equal to the churn number of the band in between. Which means that for a normal static system, if all the churn numbers of the bands are zero, it's topologically trivial and there are no edge modes. However, in this driven system now, even if these two bands have a churn number that is equal to zero, due to this non-trivial structure of the quasi-energy space, we can have a winding around it. So there can be an edge mode entering from below and one leaving from the top. So we can have a situation where we have edge modes in all the gaps, even though the churn number of the bands themselves is equal to zero. And this is a new um, situation or new topological phase that can only occur in these driven systems. And we realize such a system by periodically modulating the tunnel coupling between neighboring sites in a hexagonal optical lattice. Uh, so here we are actually working with bosons, uh, potassium atoms, and we tune the interactions to um, be as close to the non-interacting limit as possible. And here's a sketch of our lattice potential. This is a hexagonal lattice where along the red bonds 
we now periodically increase the strength of the tunnel coupling between neighboring sites. And we do it in this chiral manner. So we first um, increase tunnel coupling the, along this red one, then this one, and then this one. And experimentally, this can be implemented very nicely because the hexagonal lattice is generated by interfer interfering three laser beams under 120 degrees. And by changing the intensity of one of them, we imbalance the lattice such that uh, the tunnel couplings are different as depicted in, in these little schematics um, up there. So by varying in a cosine fashion, the intensity of uh, the three laser beams out of phase, we realize exactly this modulation uh, that is depicted in these 2D plots. And so this actually allows us to, to generate uh, this anomalous Floquet phases. And let me just show you how we can see where topological phase transitions happen between different topological phases in this periodically driven system. So let me just show you uh, this plot here, uh, where you see a measurement of the energy gap between the two lowest bands in hexagonal lattice as a function of the modulation parameters. So as a function of the modulation frequency and the modulation amplitude. And what you see here is that there's a finite energy difference. We measure it at a one specific point in the brewing zone, which then varies as a function of the modulation parameters. But then there's a gap closing point where this energy difference vanishes. And this is signaling a topological phase transition point in our, um, in our model. So in this case, you actually see two topological phase transition points. And um, now in order to have a little bit more discussion in the end, let me just show you the final um, uh, result. So we can actually characterize uh, the different geometric properties of the energy bands in the different phases by using local Hall deflection measurements that allow us to probe uh, barrier curvature in the brewing zone. So we can actually measure how the barrier curvature changes at certain positions in quasi-momentum space which allows us to extract the winding numbers that give us the full set of topological invariants characterizing the system. So you should really think about a whole measurement. We take our cold atom cloud, we apply a force to it uh, to drag it along one direction, and then we measure the transverse displacement of the cloud, which is equivalent to this whole experiment you know in solid state. So we have actually mapped out uh, this um, rich topological phase diagram to show that there are anomalous uh, Floquet phases in our system. And just um, to show uh, the people who have uh, been working on this and also our theory colleagues, and also Andre who is now in Berlin, you know, who is in Cambridge, and Nathan and Marco, who when, well, Marco was at, in Brussels at that time. Okay, so that was very quick uh, without going into the details, um, but if there are still questions, I'm happy uh, to answer them. Thank you so much, Monica. Do we have questions? Please raise your hand if you do. Maybe, ah, Anton has a question. Go ahead. Uh, thank, thanks for the talk. Um, so thinking of Floquet phases, I know certainly in, um, in condensed matter systems, uh, the heating is a big problem. Right. Can you comment on that? Say, for example, let's say you wanted to observe uh, also interactions uh, in, in the Floquet phase. Would that be a problem? Do you have any ideas how to approach or anything in that direction? So this is um, something that is known in the community now for a while and people have looked at this. Actually, we also have looked at this for weekly interacting bosonic systems where indeed you see um, that heating is an issue. We now understand better how to mitigate it. For instance, um, having like a harmonic confinement is, um, is opening up more channels, more heating channels, so to speak. So having a, a flat uh, lattice helps. But then also what is important to freeze out um, additional uh, degrees of freedom that you, that you do not want in your final model. For instance, we have been talking briefly about how to make a 2D system. We actually have a weak harmonic confinement out of plane, which serves more as a continuum of modes. It's, it's like a bath uh, coupling in the end. So there are many resonances when you turn on interactions uh, that uh, lead to resonances in the many body spectrum, which lead to heating because the system can absorb um, energy from the drive without having any, any, any gaps in the spectrum. And so what we believe 
uh, works is if we go to the strongly interacting regime. So it's a 3D lattice where the energy scales are uh, uh, more clearly separated by the Hubbard energy U and we don't have this problem of continuum of modes that our system is coupled to where we can actually work at driving frequencies that where there are no direct resonances in the spectrum. Now there can be always higher order processes which eventually will lead to a heating to infinite temperature. So this event eventually will always happen, but the goal is to find a suitable parameter regime where on intermediate time scales where we perform the experiment, this heating is suppressed and it should be also suppressed exponentially as a function of the driving frequency. So we are actually trying to um, implement these models in a regime where the driving frequency is much larger as compared to the energy scales of our system. This has not been the case in all of the measurements that um, I've cited on my slides. The idea is now to really increase it by several orders of, of magnitude, which uh, from a quantum optics perspective, I think just brings you more into the limit of the rotating wave approximation where all of these processes are, are more strongly suppressed. And uh, okay, so, so now I have, if, if I may uh, ask a follow-up question, sure. increasing or changing a parameter by a few orders of magnitude always sounds hard. How, uh, it, it how realistic is that? It is, and it basically means that the, the scheme that we want to use in order to engineer the model is completely different. So um, at, at, at all these experiments, we have played with the, the lattice potential, the energy scales in the lattice, which is just J and maybe some potential energy terms that are on a similar order. They, they are never three orders of magnitude larger than the rest. So the idea is to work actually with uh, different internal states. So you can imagine that you have a spin up and spin down again that uh, live in different lattices. So they, they can be like interlaced, for instance, they, they can only be sitting in, in this anti-magic configuration. And so there's no direct tunneling if you don't couple the two states up and down. But now if you use additional laser beams to couple these uh, states, you can turn on tunneling again. And then the, the phase will be the from the, the complex Rabi coupling matrix element. So this goes back to the old original proposal from 2005 or so, um, how to engineer these systems. And this uh, then is a completely en different energy scale, which gives you an additional tuning now. All right, thanks. Welcome. I think Stephen was next one. Yeah, sorry for holding you up <laughs> with the questions earlier. You had so much stuff you couldn't cover. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, That's okay. No so, problem. So, so a couple of things. This. Um, morphology you have here is uh, a regular hexagon but I guess you've got some tuning parameters where you can distort that yeah so we can so, so, so I was wondering about essentially the chirality if you like of those degrees of freedom and then the other thing is that your first to try and connect the first part and the second part have you considered having tilted potentials superimposed on top of these uh two-dimensional arrays? Um, so, okay, there are, there are two parts to the question. So first, um, in terms of the control that we have in this lattice and what we can tune. So in this um, honeycomb lattice, there are three different tunnel couplings, right? T1, T2, T3, which we can tune independently. And we can tune uh, sub-lattice energy offset uh, but, but I was thinking also of the geometry because I thought you, you could potentially control the actual location. Um, not all that well. So if you look at the slide here, um, you actually see that um, the position of the minima is slightly changed. So the, the tunnel coupling along the red bond is actually larger because the minima is slightly closer uh, mm -hmm. together. But um, we don't have like full control over the position of the minima. In, Interesting. In, so that, that's, a, that's an optical constraint from your, your system. Right, so it's given by the interference pattern of, of this three laser beams. And there's, there's not so much freedom you have. We can make a triangular lattice, for example, but um, we cannot freely move them around. But it was, it was essentially the aspect ratio of the, uh, of the sides, an irregular hexagon. That's not so easy to do. 
I mean, okay. in, in, what, what, certain, what a, in certain constraints, limits, but yeah. Yeah, but I mean, again, it may be impossible to do, but I was thinking more about the interesting physics that might emerge. But what about uh, having a, a so tilted... Maybe just, can, I, can I just follow up? Yeah. So actually, so we can move this minima, um, even we can make them merge, right, along this red mm -hmm. one. And mm -hmm. by uh, actually tuning this geometry, you can... Well, there have been early experiments where you see that this... Uh, uh, two Dirac points at the K and K prime point, uh, you can tune the topology of the lattice such that you can make the Dirac coins move closer together and annihilate. So can, you can actually um, even eliminate the Dirac points from the dispersion in, in the hexagonal lattice by, by changing the, the ratios. Mm. And, and a tilted potential in this two-dimensional setting as well? Well, actually um, applying a tilt is, is pretty straightforward. That's something that we can mm -hmm. easily do. Mm -hmm. um, but we haven't looked at uh, relaxation dynamics in this system. We have started looking at the tilted 2D Fermi Hubbard model. This is something we have been looking at, but not the hexagonal lattice. What we are actually looking at now is more the interplay of this um, interesting band structure with uh, disorder and trying to see um, in our cold atom experiments what happens at the edges. It, it was just the, no the notion that, in some sense, the tilt direction play an interesting role well yeah that's something we want to explore first in the square lattice actually the 2d fermi hubbard model where the tilt direction also matters for mm -hmm. the normalization yeah, thank you it. super i think babak is next please go ahead so uh, yeah thank you also for a great talk uh the phases that you were showing for the floquet uh quasi energies um so there were gap closings at zero quasi-energy, but there were also gap closings at uh, the omega over two, right? Right. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what your parameters were, but are, are those new uh, phases or? So yeah, I didn't, uh, I didn't really explain that. So here you see a sketch of the, of the phase diagram as a function of our modulation parameters. We have the driving frequency omega and the modulation amplitude. And um, how you can understand uh, the different topological phases is as follows. So first, in the static hexagonal lattice, we have the two S-bands, um, which touch at the Dirac points, at the K and K prime point. Then if we switch on the periodic modulation at very high frequency, which is large compared to the tunnel coupling J, then we open um, a gap at the Dirac cones. So now we have like edge modes. We are in the Haldane phase where the churn number of the two bands is plus and minus one and where we have edge modes in the system. So this is the high frequency limit. And then um, since we are working in this driven system, we have these fluke copies, right? So we have this fluke zone scheme. And now um, intuitively you can understand how the new phase arises when you decrease the modulation frequency, which uh, decreases the separation between the fluke zones since they are just separated by H bar omega. So you move them closer and closer together until there's a band touching point uh, between fluke zones. And at this point, uh, the churn number of the two bands has changed from plus minus one to zero. Mm -hmm. And there's a new edge mode generated between fluke zones, leaving the one around zero energy intact. So now we have both an edge mode around zero energy and one between fluke zones, which is the situation of the anomalous uh, topological phase. And now if you decrease the frequency further and further, so we're actually far from this high frequency limit, we move these Floquet copies more and more into each other. So there are more and more gap closing points. And we have characterized uh, one additional regime, which we call the Haldane like regime, um, where there's an edge mode between Floquet zones, but the one around zero energy has been eliminated. So there again, the genome of the band is plus and minus one. But now, strictly speaking, you cannot take the, the high frequency limit because there's a non trivial edge mode between Floquet zones. Mm -hmm. Right, and but in the in the plot you were showing of the gaps, uh, you said that you were measuring at the gamma point. Is that right? Right. Uh, I thought the these transitions were happening at the k point. Um. So right? this this uh, I really gap missed something. Thing so, so what I mean, actually what I meant here on that same graph that you were just showing that there were some transitions right at omega over two. These um, ones. Yes. Yeah. Are right. these the ones we were just uh, talking about? So um, this is actually um, the, the point that helps us identify where 
and the, the gap closing happens. So here in the high frequency limit. So this is, um, well, I, I didn't explain that. So the way we measure this energy gap is using a spectroscopy technique. Mm -hmm. So we uh, split a wave packet and essentially we measure oscillations or time evolution between the two bands, which occurs at the energy difference between the two bands. And since all of the measurements are stroboscopic, um, we measure always the smallest energy gap. So in principle, there can be many because we have this fluke copies, but we always measure the smaller one, which means that we are strictly bound by a value H for omega half. That's the, the largest frequency that we can measure. Right. So in this high frequency limit, we actually know that the smallest one will be always the one around zero energy because all the other fluke copies are very far away. So we will measure the energy uh, difference around zero energy. And at this point, is exactly where we have moved the Fluke copies um, to a point where uh, the two energy differences at the gamma point are exactly h for omega half. And then we start to measure the energy gap uh, between Fluke zones. So this actually allows us to identify that this gap closing point uh, happens, what we call it G pi, uh, which is between Fluke zones. And then again, the notion changes. So whenever there's a cusp, we start to measure the, the other energy yeah. gap. Okay, yeah. Uh, understood. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any more questions. We are running a bit. Ah, we have one more. Honor, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I uh, just wanted to uh, make you verify uh, something you just said. Uh, so you said like in principle, uh, you can uh, create this uh, inclined potentials for like Bose Hubbard model too, right? Like for the bosons. Right, so um, actually this measurement in the hexagonal lattice has been performed with bosonic atoms, um, tuning the interaction to the non-interacting regime, but there's also a flash bar resonance which allows us to tune the Hubbard interactions. Uh, this model can be implemented equally well with bosons or fermions. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay. I don't see any more questions. It was a long discussion already. Thank you so much, Monica, for the exciting talk. And thanks everyone for coming and listening and discussing. Thank you. And we will be back at the end of 